it's Kathy Cassidy. Um, I'm going to read you another chapter from Love from Lexi. Thank you for hanging on in there. Hope you're all handling the lockdown okay. Today I've got a couple of shout outs that I forgot from yesterday and one of them is to Ella. One is to Lynn and Laura who are listening in Scotland. Um, oh and there was another one and I've gone forgotten it. Ah, so I'll try and do that one tomorrow, sorry. Um, I hope you've all had a lovely Easter weekend. I'm recording this on Easter Monday, but um, yeah, you probably won't see it until Tuesday. I had a nice Easter, but kind of flat, kind of strange. I think it's all a little bit weird. This lockdown thing is, yeah, it brings up all sorts of strange feelings, doesn't it? So um, I hope you're, you're doing okay. Uh, not suffering from chocolate overload, I'm definitely not, what a shame. Um, and here's another chapter for you anyway, and we'll see what's going on with Lexi and the gang. And um, as usual, here is the filler, the little bit between the chapters. And today it's a song, the song is called Going Places, and Lexi has written it about Marley. So, I met a boy who laughed and touched my hand and woke me from the longest sleep. He spread his wings and told me we could soar if only I was brave enough to leap. And the chorus is, we're going places, you and I, this boy said to me. We're going places, we can fly, spread your wings, be free. I met a boy who kissed me, touched my heart, made promises of dreams I couldn't see. Behind him lay a trail of tears, but still, I thought it would be different, him and me. And then the chorus, and then another verse. I met a boy who told me to be brave, who led me to a clifftop tall and steep. He took my hand and we began to run, raced to the very edge and made our leap. And then the chorus again. And once, final verse. He soared, borne up by hope and luck and dreams, but when I jumped, I fell out of the sky. I'm falling, lost again and lonely, and he's up there now, still flying high. Oh, it's a bit sad. So chapter 21, we're on today, and it's called Famous for 15 Minutes. I would go to the ends of the earth for Marley Hayes, and yes, I'd probably jump off a cliff for him too. Not an actual cliff, obviously, but the point is, I would risk a lot if he asked me to. I think about him all the time, dream about him the way I once dreamed of Daniel Radcliffe from the Harry Potter films. I'm just not sure he feels that way about me. He's sweet, he's funny, he's endlessly flirty, but if I needed him, would he be there for me? I honestly don't know. Bex has warned me over and over that Marley never sticks with a girl for more than two weeks. Maybe my time is up. My mum walked away from me. Now I've chosen a boyfriend who might do the same. Fear of being abandoned all over again seeps through my veins like poison, waking me up at night. As for the song lyrics, I can't tell if they're actually about mum or Marley. How do you tell the boy who wrote a piece of music for you that the words you've written for it tell a sad story, one with no happy ending? I hand him my notebook lyrics and the garage band link on my mobile as we sit together on the railway carriage steps, waiting for the others to show up for Monday's band practice. Our first proper one since being evicted from the library. I'm not saying this is our story, I tell him. It's just a story that came into my head randomly. I've been stuck for ages trying to think of something and I know you needed it done, so is this okay? You did inspire it, kind of, when you mentioned going places the other day. Marley looks at the lyrics and listens to my rough cut song version for a second time and his mouth curves into a smile. It's good, he says. I think it could be our best yet, but we'd better stop calling it our song in case we end up doomed to live out the story. I am going to fly high, you know, but I'm taking you with me, Lexi Lawler. He pulls me close and leans in for a kiss. My heart starts to race and I close my eyes and part my lips, but at the last moment he veers away and kisses my nose. 
laughing. I open my eyes abruptly and laugh too, but a part of me feels hurt, rejected. It's more than a week since Marley first kissed me and that was when he last kissed me too. Aren't boys, especially boys like Marley, supposed to be mad for all that? Watch him, Bex had told me before that first date. He's going to push his luck, stands to reason. Be strict with him. But I haven't needed to be strict. There's been no lip action at all since the cafe and I'm convinced that means I'm a rubbish kisser. I probably am being new to it and all, but how am I supposed to improve if he won't come near me? How am I supposed to know what I'm doing wrong? Before I have time to worry much more, Jake, Bex and Happy come across, come wandering across the grass and we head inside. The railway carriage looks incredible now. The faded bench sofas are draped in bright blankets found on Saturday's charity shop hunt and Dylan's battered old drum kit sits in pride of place at the end of the room. Marley says he plans to keep it there from now on and that this might actually prevent a lot of family arguments. Happy sets a tin of tray bakes on the kitchen counter while I put the kettle to boil, making hot drinks for anyone who wants them. By the time I've handed out the mismatched mugs, everyone's here, setting up, tuning up, admiring the finished space and running through their pieces in a cacophony of music and chat. Are we ready? Marley yells above the noise. I hope you all like our new practice space. A big thanks to everyone who helped us get it cleared up, to Jake's stepdad for all his help, and of course to the amazing Louisa Winter for letting us use this little piece of history. So I hope you've all been practicing at home because we've got a lot to get through. He nods at Lee who lets rip with his trumpet intro and the rest of us try to remember our cues and crash in and out clumsily until Marley waves his arms and stops us and we take it from the top again. And again, and again, with directions from Marley and a few tweaks from the rest of us, until back then is sounding good once more. It takes a while, but Sasha has clearly been practising because the vocals are really tight now, and we do sound more like a band and less like a rowdy class of Year 7s messing about with the instruments when the music teacher nips out of the room. Next, Marley, Dylan, Bex and Sasha run through the library song a few times. This has been put together jigsaw style with the help of garage band links flying back and forth. But although it's basic, it's also sounding strong. Most of us have ideas about what our contributions might be. And two hours in, we manage to have both songs sounding good. We have to step it up, Marley says. We'll have another band practice on Wednesday. This festival for the libraries is a real game changer. We've got the chance to support one of the best loved stars in, of the 60s. Ked Wilder is m a music industry giant. He knows everyone there is to know in the business. And if he likes the lost and found, well, I don't need to tell you what that means. It could be our ticket to fame and fortune. Bex pulls a face. This whole festival thing is a marketing opportunity for you. Am I right? I mean, I care about the band, obviously, but this festival is all about saving the libraries. That's what really matters. Sure, Marley agrees, staring Bex down with his trademark blue-eyed charm. And we can do that better if we're really well practised and our songs are the best they can be. So I need to know if everyone is on board here. We'll have all band practices on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And in between, there'll be smaller, more focused meetups so we can work on whatever needs the most attention. If anyone thinks they'll struggle to do all this, tell me now. I'd rather know. I want everyone at practices, everyone, unless you've broken both legs or you're dying of some contagious tropical disease, be there and, and be there on time. The more we put in, the more we get out. The stakes are high for the libraries and for us as a band. Understood? There's a general murmur of agreement. No one says they can't manage the timetable, though not everyone looks overjoyed about it. What about you, Samia Bex checks? You're in year 11. Haven't you got GCSEs at the moment? Are you sure you can fit in three practices a week alongside the revision? Are your parents going to be OK with it? Samia shrugs. I'll make it work, she says. I won't let you down. I frown. The idea of the lost and found was supposed to be a place to go to connect with others, not just one more chore in an already stressful teenage life. 
be careful, Marley, I tell him as I wash the hot chocolate mugs afterwards. I know how much you love this band, but don't push people too far. Not everyone is as committed as you are. Why not? He asks, genuinely puzzled. This is our big chance, don't you see? We've got an amazing sound and we're writing our own songs and we're young, still at school, which gives us a unique selling point once the press get hold of it. If the world could just see what we're capable of, we'd go right to the top. You have to have vision. That's what Ked Wilder says in his book. I knew I would live to regret getting you a library card, I tease. You don't mean that. Marley says, switching off the lights and locking the door as we make our way down the steps. Come on, I'll walk you home. I'm only pushing them because I care. You know that, don't you? We've got something special, Lexi. You know it, I know it. We'd be crazy not to run with it. Something special. I sigh because I know without a doubt that Marley is not talking about me and him. He's talking about the lost and found. We're in the middle of Wednesday's practice, a particularly rowdy one where we're struggling to agree on how to arrange the harmonies for going places when there's a sharp knock on the window. Louisa Winter appears in the doorway, striking, as always, in a paint-stained pinafore dress and a green silk bandana tied around her hair. The trademark paintbrushes are speared through her auburn waves, of course. Were we too noisy? I say anxiously. I'm so sorry if the sound carried. We're working on a new song and it's still a bit chaotic. The music is glorious, she declares, but not loud enough to be heard up at the house. No, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I've just had a telephone call from your Miss Walker. Exciting news. The local TV news want to do a feature on the libraries and they want to talk to me and you. Reclusive lady artist and up-and-coming teen pop band. How about that? Marley jumps to attention. The TV, he checks. Really? How soon? Because we'd planned to keep our set list for the festival under wraps for just a little bit longer. Under wraps? This is Marley speak for we only have three songs. We're seriously rough around the edges and I don't think we're ready for world domination until next week at the earliest. They'll film it on Saturday to broadcast on Tuesday, Louisa is saying. I don't think they need a whole song, just a clip of a few of you, maybe playing at the library. And they want to talk to you, especially you, Lexi and Marley. You spoke so well on the radio last weekend, it seems. Miss Walker is keen for Bex to be there and then whoever else you want to bring along. Possibly not the whole band. There are rather a lot of you. Miss Walker said six would be plenty. Didn't I say we'd be famous, Marley Crows? I knew it, didn't I tell you? Miss Winter just laughs. Fame is somewhat overrated, she tells us, but it's not always easy to convince the young of that fact, especially these days. We're all a bit obsessed, it seems. Everybody can be famous for 15 minutes, as Andy used to say. He had some very strange ideas on a lot of things, but with that one, I have to admit, he was spot on. Who's Andy? I whisk, whisper to Bex. Andy Warhol, she whispers back. Super famous pop artist, bit of a weirdo, friend of Miss Winter, clearly. So the TV crew will be at Bridge Street Library at five o'clock on Saturday, Louisa Winter tells us. Be there on time and bring your instruments in case they do want an action shot of some sort. And I love what you've done with this place. Groovy, as we used to say back in the day. I'll see you on Saturday. Louisa Winter exits as dramatically as she arrived, leaving us all in stunned silence. Thanks to the library campaign, we've already been on the radio and now a TV appearance is looming. It's great for the band, obviously, but for me, it could be life-changing. Not everybody listens to the radio, but the TV? That is pretty popular, right? Anybody could be watching, even my mum. She might switch on the telly and catch a glimpse of the girl she left behind more than three years ago. She'd drop everything, of course, and call the TV station to track me down, and then we'd be back together again. There are just those old niggles. Why she'd need to spot me on TV in the first place. Why she hasn't been to the police or social services trying to track me down, and why she didn't come back in the first place. Amnesia, maybe. If she's lost her memory, could a TV appearance trigger a return? 
I don't know. Lexi, you're crying, Bex whispers, and I wipe away tears with my sleeve because I do not want to fall apart here or now or ever. One more time, Marley calls out, oblivious to my meltdown, and the lost and found crash into action again. So you'll have to tune in tomorrow to see how that uh, all goes, and I'll see you then, but until then, keep smiling. Take care.